What is up, you guys? UFC 285. We have an epic card about to take place this upcoming Saturday. One of the goats of mixed martial arts, John Jones, makes his return to the octagon. He's jumping up in weight to the heavyweight division, taking on one of the best men up there in Cyril Gaon. Uh, there's, there's so many things to talk about in regards to that fight. Make sure you stay tuned to my main event prediction because I have a lot to say about that fight. You guys know how we do it here, though. We start at the bottom of the card. We work our way up to the top. We're talking betting lines, how these fighters match up, and all that. I appreciate you guys for stopping by. As you see, the channel is ever-evolving. There's so many new things going on here, and you guys can expect to see a lot of new things moving forward in the next month or two. So if you guys like what you see, hit that subscribe button, like this video. You guys also see I got those free bets coming your guys' way. You guys can expect a free bet for UFC 285. I'll have that here uh, posted on the channel in the next couple days or so. And as you guys know, we already cashed the first free bet that I gave to you guys uh, for that UFC Vegas 69 card. I have a free play that I already threw your guys' way for UFC Vegas 70. You have to stay tuned to see if that cashed because the card hasn't taken place as I'm recording this right now. Uh, but I'm willing to bet that it does cash. So uh, hopefully you guys like those free bets coming your guys' way as well. Now, with that all being said, we're going to jump into the first fight. Let's get to it. Uh -huh. Welcome to the show. This is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. So kicking the card off, we got Farid Basharat taking on Daman Blackshear. Uh, Farid Basharat, obviously one of the Basharat brothers, as I like to call them, the Bash brothers. Both of them extremely promising, both undefeated. Uh, you know that we're very familiar with them as we cashed official plays on both of them within the same week uh, with Farid uh, coming through on Dana White's Contender Series in a, a very exciting fight and in a fight where he actually took on a fighter that I have a lot of respect for uh, in Alan Bogoso. And he went out there, he got the job done. Javid capitalized, got a victory uh, that, that same week as well. These fighters are very, very technically sound everywhere the fight goes. Uh, if a fight goes down to the mat, their jujitsu is very polished up. Uh, when we're talking about uh, their striking, it's extremely technical. That's the word that comes to mind when I think of, of both of the brothers. Um, you know, and I want to talk about Javid as well because um, they, they are very similar fighters. They throw very straight shots. Their boxing is very crisp. The sh shots come straight down the middle. Uh, nice leg kicks, nice calf kicks, uh, good distance management. They're very polished fighters. Uh, for, for the amount of experience they have right now, you would imagine that they almost have double the amount of experience uh, fighting as a pro, as pros, um, but but not a lot of ex of pro experience. But like I said, when you watch them in the cage, they're they're very solid and they check off a lot of boxes. Uh, Blackshear, on the other hand, uh, coming out of Jackson Wink, uh, he's an explosive athlete. He's decently well rounded. Uh, he's a wild fighter. He can hit you with the big shot. Uh, there could be a wild scramble. Next thing you know, he's he's pulling a choke off or something like that. I mean, he's a wild dude. Uh, he is a true athlete. Uh, you know, he already had the luxury of stepping down in the octagon. He's had his UFC debut. That fight went to a draw. If you guys remember, he started off strong in that fight, uh, taking the first two rounds against Yusuf Zalal, but then getting 10 aided in the third round, really uh, fizzling out in, in, in that third round. Um, you know, it wasn't really a good look the way that he finished that fight. Uh, Yusuf Zalal was, was looking for the finish there. Um, I think that Blackshear... Should should come into this fight a little bit more confident. Already putting that that first fight behind him now. I think that he'll let let loose in this fight a little bit more. So he'll look for a big shot. But at the end of the day, I think that that Farid is just going to be more technically sound. And I I gotta lean gotta lean Farid's way here. Um, he's only twenty five years old. I expect to see that growth coming. Uh, you know, if we take a look at, at their stature here. Um, Basharat will have a two inch reach advantage, roughly, maybe about a one and a half inch reach advantage or so. Uh, I don't really expect anything really to be going on there. As far as their height goes, uh, Daman a little bit taller as well. So Farid might look a little bit undersized, but he makes up for it when it comes to his technical ability. So let's go take a look at the betting line. Uh, as you guys can tell, I'm leaning Farid Basharat's way. Now he's a minus 525 favorite. That's a high line. That, that's a pretty high line uh, against a, a fighter in Blackshear. Fighting out of Jackson Wink. We know that he gets a lot of attention over at Jackson Wink. That 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 fight uh, that fight facility is not what it once was. It doesn't have a lot of the huge names coming out of there like it used to. And uh, from what I hear, Blackshear gets, gets some good attention there. And they're really trying to support him to get this victory here. And uh, he's a plus 340 underdog. And 
I think you could potentially argue that there's some value on that line. I'm not necessarily crazy, but a minus 525 line on Farid Basharat. I do expect him to take this fight. I'm going to say that he wins this fight uh, via unanimous decision, just just outpacing Blackshear and just being more crisp with it, with his striking and his boxing and, and his kicking game as well. Just outpointing uh, Blackshear here, getting the job done. And uh, from a value standpoint, I guess I'm going to lean more value on that plus 340 line. But be careful there because I think ba I think at the end of the day, Basharat handles business. Jessica Penne taking on Tabitha Ritchie. Jessica Penne now 40 years old. We know that she had a long layoff uh, dating back to, to a year or so before making her return to the octagon. She had some initial success, uh, right? She went in there and she, 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 she did, she had some impressive performances. She went out there, she pulled an arm bar uh, off against uh, Karolina Kovacavich. She went out there and stole a, a decision against Lup Lupi Gorinez, uh, Lupita, a fighter that a lot of people uh, are high on. And uh, she was able to go in there and squeak off a closely contested match. Uh, but then in her last fight, she went out there and she got beat down by Emily Ducate. And that loss looks worse than ever because in Emily's last fight, she looked horrendous. And then you got to wonder, you know, Emily Ducate was kind of getting hyped up from this performance here. But but was it just uh, due to the fact that Jessica Penne is really starting to slow down? Like I said, she's 40 years old. Uh, you see her uh, getting in a workout over here with uh, with Angela Hill. Uh, looks like they're trying to, you know, shake it up for the camera. Maybe you see an OnlyFans coming your way uh, soon. Uh, hopefully not. Uh, you know, I think that you guys would rather see an OnlyFans uh, coming from this side of, side of the the table here. And Tabitha Ritchie, the baby shark, only 28 years old, 12 years younger than uh, than Penne here. Now, if, if you look into the numbers of of fighters facing off against older opponents, right? Younger fighters. Statistically, the younger fighters are winning uh, at a higher clip, at a higher percentage. And I think when you actually look in, look into that that uh, those numbers even more in detail, when you talk about a 12-year difference and you talk about a fighter hitting the 40 mark, I'm willing to guarantee you that the percentage is extremely high in the younger fighter. So keep that in mind here. Tabitha Ritchie, uh, she's been looking really good as of recently. We, we know that she lost her, her UFC debut but it was against Manon Farot, who a lot of people believe is going to be fighting for that gold in the near future. Uh, she did get finished, but again, understand it was Manon Farot. Don't put her under a magnifying glass. After that loss, she bounced back with two impressive performances, taking out Pollyanna Viana, who has shown to be a better fighter than maybe a lot of people gave her credit for, maybe me included. Uh, you know, people thought that she's more of just a looker, but she's shown she's feisty. And the baby shark went out there and used her grappling and just controlled that fight. She used her grappling to dominate M Maria Oliveira as well. She's shown that she's working on her striking. Uh, I know that she's going to be at a little bit of a uh, reach disadvantage here, uh, but but I'm not too worried about that. I think that uh, as bad as Penne looked in her last fight in the striking department, uh, I'm going to say that Richie can close the distance and she can, she can handle herself on the feet. Uh, when it comes to the, to the reach, she'll be at a six inch reach disadvantage. But like I said, I'm not too worried about that. Um, she's going to be the shorter opponent, obviously as well, four inches shorter, but I think that Richie is, is the fighter that is, uh, starting to reach her prime more. So she's, she's cruising into her early thirties slowly. Well, Jessica Penny is cruising into her forties and I'm just not a fan of it. And I'm not a fan of the performance that she just put out. So I'm not going to pick her uh, to win the fight. And I'm pr most likely not going to say that there's value next to her name, even though there's a high plus 190 line next to her name, uh, the minus 240 line on Richie. Yeah, you would like it a little bit lower, but with that performance that Penny just put out there, it's completely understandable, and uh, I think it's an accurate line. I'm going to say that Tabitha Ritchie goes out here, dominates, wins a unanimous decision, taking all three rounds. Um, but yes, you probably would like that line a little bit better. Uh, you got to be a little bit careful with women's mixed martial arts, uh, but Tabitha handles this, handles this fight. We got a bantamweight scrap with the surging youngster here, Cameron Simone, the South African. We know that him and Drickus Duplessis are really holding it down for South Africa right now. Uh, Mana Martinez, uh, you talk about a scrappy fighter. Uh, you got to think of, of a fighter like Mana Martinez. He's going out there. He's always trying to take his opponent's head off. He's a little bit lacking uh, from a technical standpoint, though, for being honest. And, uh, you know, I think that Cameron's going to be just a more technically sound fighter here. And he's going to be able to work his way into the inside. He's a little bit undersized, but that's nothing new for Cameron. Uh, we take a look at the reach here. He'll, he'll have about a three-inch reach disadvantage. Uh, he's going to be about two inches shorter. But like I said, he, he he's a very technical fighter that will definitely work his way into the inside and he'll look to land those big shots. Now, in Cameron's last two fights, 
He had uh, third round finishes uh, via strikes. We, we've really seen him push the pace on his opponents. He doesn't slow down. He's looking to take his opponent's head off throughout the entire fight. Uh, is he is he live to get a knockout on a guy like Manaboy? Manaboy only has three losses thus far in his career. Uh, two via decision, one via sub. He's never been put out via strikes. Uh, so so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because Mana sh has shown that he has a granite chin. Uh, we talked about how he's lacking a little bit with his skill set. Even defensively, he eats a lot of shots. He'll walk forward and he'll eat those shots. Uh, so Cameron might have the potential to be the first man to knock him out. He'll have that opportunity to land that big shot. But with that same token, on that same token, Mana Boy has a granite chin. So what's going to give there? Uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, Mana has some serious power too, so Cameron better watch out. He can't just go in there recklessly looking to, to just uh, put him out with ease because Mana Boy throws, throws bombs as well. Um, but, but I'm on the youngster here. He's really proven himself to me. Now, he came into his fight on Dana White's Contender Series as an underdog, if you guys remember, uh, against Bruce Leroy's, um, excuse me, Bruce Lee's uh, grandson. Uh, if you guys remember that fight, he, he just he fought just like Bruce Lee. Uh, and, and he was actually, I forgot the guy's name, but he was winning the beginning of that fight uh, before Cameron just eventually completely took that fight over. Uh, and let me pull him up real quick because his name was Josh Wang Kim. And, and Josh actually had has a lot of respect on the regional scene. He has a, a lot of amateur fights. He was a champion come, on the regional scene coming into that fight. He was a, he was the favorite. And uh, Cameron showed up, made a name for himself. And then he goes in there in his UFC debut and puts out Stephen Coslow. I think this is a little bit of a step up in competition, but I think Cameron uh, will hold true and he'll get the job done here. I've been very pleased with what I've seen from the kid. And with his age, you got to expect that he's just going to look better than ever, especially on a big stage like this. He just seems to rise to the occasion. So let's go take a look at the betting line here where you will see the South African is without a doubt going to be the favorite here. Uh, he's going to be... Uh, let's see if we can, we can find him here. He's hiding from me here. He is a, of course, because Leo Mana Martinez, and he always gets me there because I'm always thinking Mana. But uh, Cameron Simone is a minus 265 favorite. It's not a, it's 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 a high line. It's not a cheap line. And um, the comeback on Lamana Martinez, Mana Martinez is a plus 210. Uh, yeah, the line does seem to be a little bit high on, on Simone, but... I think he's going to get the job done here. So I really don't want to point you guys to throwing that dog money at Martinez. Uh, I mean, he is a dog. You know, if you, if you guys catch my drift, he's a dog of a fighter. But I don't know how live of a dog he is here, even at that plus 210 mark. I just think that Simon is going to light him up here. And uh, I'm rolling with Cameron here. And I guess I'm going to say there's more value even on that minus 265 line. It's an accurate line. And I'll teeter-totter. I'll lean towards Cameron's way just because I think he shines once once again. One of the brighter stars working their way through the ranks these days, Ian Gary. He's taken on Kenan Song, a fighter that has shown time and time again that he's an exciting guy. Win or loss, uh, he's a fighter that goes out there and looks to perform. So you got to shoot some respect towards Song's way. Uh, Ian Gary, another fighter that's going to be coming in as, as a, a decent favorite here. We'll get to the line here in a minute. Ian Gary has really showcased that, that his striking uh, is a problem for... Anyone that steps in there with him uh, thus far, and it's probably going to be a problem for many men to come. Uh, you see him sharpening up his skill set here with, in my mind, one of the best striking coaches in all of MMA, uh, Henry Hooft. And uh, you know, from what I've seen, Henry really spends a good amount of time with Ian. Uh, Ian has shown to have good takedown defense so far. He wants to keep the fight standing, and he just uh, wants to have the ability to showcase how technical he is with his striking. Uh, you know. I think that this fight's going to take place on the feet, so he's really going to have uh, a chance to go out here and shine. Uh, Kenan Song's coming off a knockout loss. He was just knocked out by Max Griffin. Max Gr Griffin carries some some decent power, uh, not nearly as technical as a guy like Ian Gary. I think that Ian Gary really has the potential to give Kenan Song some issues here. Uh, Ian Gary, only 25 years old, so the UFC grooming him slowly through the ranks. I think that that's a smart move here. A little bit of a layup fight. But at the same time, we, we do need to uh, recognize that, that Kenan Song has went out there and he showcased to have some fight ending ability as well via strikes. So uh, maybe he can clip Ian coming in. Uh, but, but I think that Ian Gary will just be patient and will just start to pick uh, Kenan Song apart. Uh, you know, Real quick, we take a look at, at what uh, Kenan Song has been doing. Uh, out of his uh, 19 victories, nine of them have came by way of, of KO or TKO. Uh, you know, just just about half of his victories come by way of fight stopping strikes. So 
that is the, the threat that he puts out there against Ian Gary. Uh, you see him putting in some work with Uriah Faber. Uriah Faber really has been doing his thing as a coach as of recently. And I have major respect for what they got going on over there at Team Alpha Male. Uh, one of the true uh, GOAT gyms out there. One of the top uh, gyms. Although, uh, I will say that, that I lean a little bit more towards the Sanford side of things. Which I know nowadays it's not Sanford, right? It's uh, Team... Uh, excuse me, I should... Uh, slip in my mind right now team high cliff or something like that i gotta look that up comment below if you know what we're talking about um but but it, i still refer to it as team sanford mma they constantly want to change the name of that gym black zillions hard knocks 365 uh sanford mma and now team team kill cliff um which i believe might be some type of uh some type of protein bar some type of sponsorship sponsor like that whatever um we're riding with Ian Gary here. I think that Ian's just going to be a little bit too much of a problem for Ken and Song on the feet. Uh, Ian Gary is going to be about three inches taller. He's going to have a, a two and a half, three inch reach advantage too. He'll be the more rangy fighter. And again, you could expect to see his skill set uh, grow even more so uh, compared compared to a guy like Ken and Song, who I think we've seen already what he is. Um, Ian Gary looking to represent Ireland. We know Conor McGregor's making the return uh, to, to the octagon and, and, and within this year, most likely. Uh, very different type of fighters. Ian Gary is a, is a good guy. Uh, he's just an easy going, good dude. Well, you guys know the notorious one is cut from a different cloth, but Ian Gary, uh, he's just a good old boy. And um, I don't know, can anybody elaborate what's up with that, with the thing? I kind of missed that. You know how he added Machado to his last name? Uh, I know his, his last name's Gary, right? He got married. Did he take his wife's last name and, and kind of hyphen it in? Ooh, uh, let me not say too much about that. But uh, like I said, he's the nice guy. And uh, sometimes the nice guys finish last, but in this spot, that, that won't be the case. I got Ian Gary to win this fight. Uh, a very polished fighter, a, a very polished striker and working on his overall skill set. He's going to be a major major factor in the in this division. He's a minus 700 favorite against Kenan Song. That's a very high line. Uh, man, I mean, what are you going to do with that? I mean, am I going to say that, that I'm leaning towards a minus 700 line on Ian Gary? I don't think I'm going to say that on the mic right now, but Ian Gary is going to get the job done here and you wanted to get in on that line earlier. Uh, if you could have possibly, I mean, let's take a look at at how this line has moved. Uh, remember now, we're, we're recording this um uh, you know, a decent amount of time out from the fight. So you'll, you'll see some line movement uh, as we lead up to the fight. So, you know, as of right now, let's see what we could pull up here. UFC 285, we're taking a look at Ian Gary and where this line, I mean, he was a minus, 50, uh, minus 500 on Caesars. He's now a minus 550 there. So probably the best line you're, you were able to get on this, if you guys were super early to the party, was a minus 550 line, minus 500 line. You're going to be seeing those minus 700 lines and it's probably only going to get worse. You'll probably be a minus 850. If you're if you're reckless, throw it in a two-team parlay, and uh, it'll be a leg that that probably that will hit for you. How about that? One of the more lackluster fights on this card, and it's still really not a bad fight. Julian Marquez taking on Mark Andre Barriut, and uh, two tough middleweight fighters. Julian Marquez, we know that he's the type of fighter that really goes out there to finish the fight. Uh, you take a look at his uh, nine victories, and we're talking about. All nine of them coming by coming by via finish, right? Finishing the fight, five of them knockouts, four of them subs. So show, showing some diversity there as well. Uh, this is a fighter that that doesn't really win decisions often. Doesn't have the best or the greatest amount of activity. Uh, he kind of throws heavy shots, and uh, I mean we've seen him have some some big comebacks in the octagon as well, where he was losing even to to questionable opponents. Uh, Mark Andre Beriut, uh, you know. It's been a little bit up and down as of recently. You take a look at, at what he's been doing. Uh, just got submitted by Anthony Hernandez, who's really been doing his thing. Before that, uh, he was able to go out there and run through Jordan Wright. Jordan Wright just, just can't get a W in the octagon these days. So that victory doesn't look that great. Before that, he loses to Chidi and Jokowani. We know Chidi's a eight. He's a solid threat. Uh, so it's kind of hard to judge him with those two losses. Uh, before that, he takes out Dalcha Lingambula, a, a, a lower level opponent once again. Uh, so, you know, can Mark go out there and can he defeat a reputable opponent? I mean, victory over Abu uh, Azatar before that. A uh, uh, we, we had, a, I think, a no contest against Oscar Pichota. There was something going on there. Um, I believe that's where uh, Mark uh, failed the drug test, I do believe. Losses to John Young Park, Christoph Jocko, Andrew Sanchez there. I mean, showing that he's he's losing against, against those mediocre UFC uh, opponents. So, you kind of just... 
making it clear that that Mark is not really a phenomenal fighter in the division, but neither is Julian Marquez. And you know what? I'm going to favor Mark in this fight here uh, based on the fact that he is shown to be decently durable. And if Julian Marquez doesn't get that finish, um, he, he's not the most active fighter as we talked about. Uh, real quick, let, let's pull some up real quick. Let's look. Let's take a look at Mark Andre uh, Berriot and his losses, and and how many times has he been has he been finished? Uh, out of his six losses, he's been knocked out once and subbed once. Right out of those six losses, so he, he's shown to be a pretty durable fighter. I'm gonna say that he avoids that 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 fight ending shot uh, against Julian, and I'm gonna say he avoids the sub and just kind of out volumes and outworks Julian Marquez. We've seen that Mark Andre can, can push the pace uh, against his opposition, and I think that we'll see him do that here. He has a two inch reach advantage. Uh, he's actually going to be uh, an inch shorter, even though he has that reach advantage. And uh, I'm going to say that he just outworks Julian a little bit here. Julian Marquez is also coming off a devastating loss, if you guys remember there. So uh, coming off a devastating loss to Gregory, Gregory Rodriguez, which we do hold in high regards. But at the same time, Julian Marquez still did take that, that devastating loss there. And his chin was impacted and hurt. So we'll see how he looks coming into this fight. You never know. He he may get, get dropped and finished by, by a... By just a an average shot, right? I mean, you don't know. We got to see how that chin holds up. Uh, again, before that, victories over Sam Alvi and Maki Patolo, lower level competition. Uh, the loss to Alessio De Chirico got outworked in that fight. I could see something similar happening here. I'm just not overly confident in Julian Marquez. I'm not necessarily a fan of his either. One time, you know, he added me uh, into his his Instagram live. He's bringing people on, and he was getting a little uh, a little snarky and uh, you know a little bit. Uh, quick-witted with the teller and the teller didn't really appreciate that so uh you know i'm never really cho cho uh, rooting on marquez but even from a professional uh, perspective i'm taking mark andre here I, I think that he could outwork uh i think he could outwork marquez easily in this fight he puts out a, a, a good amount a high rate and marquez puts out a low rate so if marquez doesn't find that finish he's going to run into some trouble uh and that's that's a recipe that will lead me towards mark mark andre Barriot's way he's a minus 125 favorite the comeback on marquez is a plus 105 it's essentially a pick em. it's a very close line and um i'm taking mark andre i don't mind uh chipping up a couple points to go his direction i just i feel he takes this fight i would take mark andre anywhere from the the minus 140 line down anything if, if it gets higher than that i think that you should be a little bit careful he's a fighter that really hasn't uh, proven that he goes can go out there and uh and handle business so you got to be a little bit careful there uh but in this matchup yes i'm, I'm taking mark andre to get the job done here and i'm going to say he wins a decision he outworks julian and gets that unanimous decision there two very talented brazilian flyweight fighters throwing down here vivian arajo taking on amanda rebus uh, both fighters only winning one of their last three fights but understand that the two fighters that they that they each lost to were both very talented uh one of one of those fighters uh giving both of them a loss and caitlin chikogian and and then if you look at the other losses that they both took amanda rebus uh, getting knocked out uh, against uh, Marina Rodriguez, a very nasty Muay Thai fighter. Uh, Vivian taking a, a loss as well against Alexa Grosso, who's about to be contesting for, for the, the championship uh, here very soon. Um, we're about to be talking about that fight So uh, th on this card. So just understand that, that their losses have came by way uh, of very talented opposition as of recently. Other than that, th th these women go out there and they handle business. And, uh, you know, I think that Vivian is going to want to keep this fight standing, of course. Her striking has looked good. She has very sharp and powerful strikes. Uh, on the other hand, Amanda Ribas, we all know that that her ground game is very, very highly respected. Uh, her father is very respected in the BJJ world, and obviously he groomed Ribas from a very young age. Uh, sometimes Amanda Ribas gets a little bit too comfortable uh, striking, and she tries to showcase that she's, she's working on uh, her overall striking, and it's cost her. We talked about... Uh, the Marina Rodriguez knockout loss. She should have been pushing the grappling more so. Um, this is a little bit of a similar type of matchup, in my opinion. I think if Amanda Rebus gets too comfortable here, she could put herself in danger. I think she should really look uh, to, to bring this fight down to the mat and try to showcase uh, her, her grappling and control this fight. Maybe wear, wear out Vivian early, and then if the fight goes up to the feet, she could try to outpace uh, Vivian and showcase some diverse striking there when there's not as much of a threat as Vivian cracking her with a big shot um because because vivian does possess uh th that that type of power um let's take a look real quick at some of the work that sh she's been doing as of recently we talk about the loss against uh, grasso before that 
uh, bullies Andrea Lee, using her her strength to to really just kind of uh, out muscle and just outpower a girl in Andrea Lee in that fight. Uh, victories over Roxanne Matafari and Montana De La Rosa. Uh, I'm not necessarily crazy about the loss that she had against Jessica. I uh, believe that was in, in the bantamweight division. I may be wrong there. Either way, that that wasn't a good look. But that was in 2019, and other than that, she's looked good as of recently. Um, but you know what? Amanda Rebus is going to be the more well-rounded fighter in this spot. And I'm leaning Amanda Rebus here. I think that she just needs to use the ground game. Uh, her most recent victory was over Verna Jendi Roba, a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, uh, a, a ground specialist as well. And she showcased that she was the better fighter there overall. A uh, victory over Paige Van Zant, Randa Marcos, and Mackenzie Dern. As of recently, I saw the Mackenzie Dern fight live. She was able to uh, really outstrike Mackenzie Dern. That's where she was showcasing that she's been working on her striking. But again, I want to see her get this fight down to the mat, and I want to see her uh, look to have some success there. I'm going to side with Amanda Rebus here. Uh, she's a, a great girl in her fight most recently against Caitlin Chikogi, and some people thought that she actually won that fight. It was very close, and Caitlin Chikogi, like I said, is no joke. So uh, I'm going to say we're, we're riding with Amanda Rebus here. She's a minus 125 25 favorite, a very slight favorite. It's almost a pick em here with the comeback on Vivian at plus 105. Just know that Vivian's a powerful striker. She has good Muay Thai. But, but Amanda, she plays this fight smart. This is her fight to win here. Uh, but will she play it smart or will she try to test uh, Vivian on the feet a little bit too much and maybe slip up? Uh, I'm saying Amanda Rebus uh, writes the ship here, gets in the win column. And uh, I'm going to say there's obviously more value in a minus 125 line, which is essentially almost a pick em line. Uh, but, but do understand that Vivian's dangerous, so it won't be a walk in the park. But I like I like Rebus here. She's young. Keep in mind, she still hasn't even cracked 30 yet. She's going to get better and better and better. And uh, give, give me Amanda Rebus to get the job done. Maybe pulling off a submission victory here. Maybe maybe doing something down on the mat. Uh, we'll see. Blonde Brunson looks to make his return to the octagon. Coming off a devastating loss against Jared Cannonier. He's taking on Drickus Duplessis, who we know has some serious power uh, as well. So uh, Derek Brunson... Better be cleaning some things up on the feet. Otherwise, he could be taking another nap. Uh, he's about to be 40 years old. He's up there in age. He has held up very well over the years. He has had uh, a lot of success as of recently. You know, you, you look back before that loss that he took to Jared Cannonier, uh, taking out Darren Till, Kevin Holland, Edmund Shabazian, Ian Heinish, uh, Elias Theodoro, rest in peace. Um, I mean, he's went out there and he, he's been doing his thing even up there in age. Uh, we, we know that he's still hanging around with a bunch of killers. There he is over at uh, Team Kill Cliff, Sanford MMA, uh, over there with, with uh, Gilbert Burns, uh, Jason Jackson, uh, just a lot of studs over there. You know, and, and I expect Derek Brunson, even though he's up there in age, I expect him to, to still... Uh, to, to hold up with his skill set. I think that he's still a major threat. Uh, but Drickus Duplessis is just, uh, he's, a, he's a different type of animal. I mean, this, this fighter carries some serious power. Uh, but check this out. Even though we have we really think of Drickus Duplessis as that fighter that's always looking to land that bomb and, and knock his, his opposition out. Uh, Drickus Duplessis, you take a look at his overall mixed martial arts career. And we're, we're talking about a fighter. He has, what, 19 pro wins, 18 pro wins, excuse me here. Out of those 18 victories... 10 submission victories as well. And some of those fights, he has hurt his his opponent and the fight, you know, hurt him on the feet and then has eventually subbed him. But he's, he's a decently well-rounded op uh, opponent. He's a decently well-rounded fighter. And uh, he's only 29 years old. He's obviously much more in his prime. We talked about th that, that statistic of younger fighters winning a lot more so than older fighters and how that's even magnified when you're talking about fighters creeping up to the 40-year-old to the mark, um, you know, that's something you definitely want to take into consideration here. Uh, Drickus Duplessis, in my opinion, uh, is going to be a problem for Derek Brunson here. We know that Brunson has good wrestling and can kind of he can kind of hypnotize his his uh, he can kind of hypnotize um, his opposition. And I'm throwing this word opposition around too much. I'll slow that down. But you know he can kind of hypnotize uh, the, the fighters he's facing off against. Uh, as of recently, it's weird. It's like he's slow in there, but somehow he holds up. He'll sneak off a takedown, and he 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 works his little leg kicks from the outside. Uh, but but his his striking defense, in my opinion, is a little bit questionable. Sometimes he leaves his chin up there high. I know that if you think about the fighters that have taken him out in those positions, uh, Robert Whitaker, Israel Adesanya, we're talking about very high level uh, fighters. 
But still, when you're watching the tape, I mean, you see that chin, it's just up there. And I think that Drickus Duplessis can capitalize on that. I really uh, think that there's some serious potential for Duplessis to land a big strike here. Uh, he'll be at a, Duplessis will be at a one inch reach disadvantage, if you want to call it that. Very similar there. Both men, uh, 73 inches, both men, uh, the same height. And, you know, I'm taking Drickus Duplessis to land that big shot. I think that on a big card like this, uh, I could, I could so see Drickus making a statement. We've seen him do that before. We've seen him go out there and land a, a big knockout blow on, on a big card before. And, um, you know, coming off a submission victory over Darren Till, uh, went out there, defeated Brad Tavares, knocked out Trevin Giles, uh, knocked out Marcus Perez, uh, in his, uh, I believe in his UFC debut. That was, yes, it was, that was, that's where he really had his coming out party. I believe that was on a big fight card there. And I can see something similar, uh, happening to, to that here. I think that, uh, Father time always prevails, and Derek Brunson's going to be in trouble here. And I think that that big shot's going to be landed on him. Uh, we take a look at the betting line. Drickus is a minus 220 favorite. The comeback on Derek Brunson, a plus 175. That line kind of reminds me of, of that Kevin Holland fight. So uh, I think it might have even been worse, actually. So just be careful. Derek Brunson has came through as an underdog a lot over the last couple of years. Does he do it once again? You know, he's going to have the, the, uh, the hair... Uh, bleached up. I think in his last fight, he, did, he didn't come in as blonde, blonde Brunson. So I think that I, I might be wrong there, but uh, there's some speculation. He's bringing Bron, blonde Brunson back. And when he's blonde Brunson, he just simply does not lose. Uh, but in all seriousness, Drickus Duplessis telling a big overhand right or, or some type of nasty hook um, and end this fight. Cody Garbrandt stepping back into the octagon. Uh-oh. Brace yourself. Taking on Trevin Jones. Uh, Cody was supposed to be taken on Julio Arce. Julio did have to withdraw from this fight. In steps Trevin Jones. Uh, so do keep, do keep that in mind. Uh, Trevin Jones stepping in on, on somewhat short notice here. Uh, he's 13-9 and nine as a pro. Not the greatest record for Trevin Jones. Uh, but I'll tell you what. I, I think that Trevin Jones can crack. The, the first thing that comes to mind uh, what was that big knockout victory, which I believe was in his UFC debut um, against the little Tasmanian Devil that continued to to push the pace on him. The, the uh, Dagestani, um, let's pull that up real quick. If you guys remember that fight uh, against Timur Valiv, it ended up being turned over to a no contest due to, I think, marijuana with some type of BS uh, overturn overturning there. Uh, but Timur Valiv was pushing the pace on, on Trevin the entire fight. Trevin continued to work on stuff in those takedowns and uh, working himself with the wizard up against the cage, landing elbows, landing strikes, eventually cracking Timur with the shot, putting him out. Uh, so showcasing that he does have that power. He has a victory over Mario Batista as well. Batista is a fighter that I'm very high on. Now, as of recently, a loss to Syed Yakob Kakrakmanov, very talented fighter. Javid Basharat, very talented fighter. Hayoni Barcelos, a talented fighter, even though Father Time caught up to Hayoni. Those are high-level opponents here. Understand that. That three-fight losing skid isn't it necessarily exactly what you think it is. Trevin Jones can crack, and I'm a little surprised that, that the UFC is, is throwing him in there. I understand that due to uh, the initial opponent, Arce, pulling out, the UFC had to make something happen here. Uh, but I think that Trevin Jones is a fighter that can go out here and put Cody's lights out once again. We know the new nickname everybody wants to give Cody is no chin. We, we just know that the, the chin has absolutely dissipated uh, ever since TJ Dillashaw uh, went in there on performance-enhancing drugs and absolutely stole Cody's chin, just taking him out two times in a row. Uh, you know, the loss there, the loss there. Pedro Munoz knocks him out. He was able to get a beautiful knockout against Rafael Asuncao, but after that, uh, get, gets bullied around by Rob Font uh, and then gets knocked out against Kai Kara France, the little man uh, down there in the, in the flyweight division. Um, now, this fight uh, taking place in the bantamweight division, and I um, just want to confirm that real quick, right, because his last fight was... Uh, in the bantamweight division, uh, but yes, this fight yeah, taking place in the bantamweight division. Of course, going back up in weight, there was all the talks of the the bad weight cut there and whatnot. And um, listen, I'm going to cut to the chase. I, I'm actually going to say that I don't think it was just the weight cut. I think that Cody's chin is gone, and I have no faith in it. He's so talented. I, I love his his head movement and, and whatnot. I mean, for the most part, he can avoid shots, but it only just takes one. And and Cody tends to engage in, the, in those slug test types of fights. And it just takes that one shot. And as of recently, we've seen it usually catches him. Just that, that one shot wobbles him and put, and then it sets him up to be teed off on and be hit with that big shot. I think that that Trevin five-star Jones is a fighter that, that can land that shot. And you know what? 
I think he's an underrated fighter. I'm taking the dog here as we go cruise over and check the betting line. Uh, I am going to be taking the dog uh, to, to win this fight. But real quick, uh, Trevin Jones also will have a four and a half reach advantage. Uh, even though he's an inch shorter, he will have that reach advantage. So um, he, I think he's going to, he's going to, touch Cody up. I, I do. I think he's going to at least touch him up once or twice. And that once or twice is going to be enough to, to seal the deal. I'm taking Trevin Jones to get the knockout victory here. But let's take a look at the betting line here where you're going to see Cody is a minus 170 favorite with the comeback on Trevin at plus 145. I find that line a little bit intriguing. We know that Cody, uh, from a betting perspective, his line maybe has been overvalued as of recently. Uh, of course, people remember when he was really doing his thing, outgunning guys like Dominic Cruz uh, and, and all those all those guys that he took out, working his way up to the, the eventual title that he held. Uh, but he really just hasn't been that same fighter. He had that big knockout against Hassan Sal, but other than that, I mean, it's just been nothing but a disaster for Cody. And I think that if you guys are taking a minus 170 line on Cody, uh, I mean, hey, comment below if you're taking that. I mean, he, he very well may, may be... The, over, the better overall fighter, the better athlete, the better mixed martial artist. But I just don't trust the chin. And if you guys are willing to, to trust the chin there uh, on a minus 170 line, uh, let me know. Comment below because understand that Trevin can crack. Now, if Trevin doesn't land that big shot, he might be in trouble if this, this fight goes to the judging, judges' scorecards. Uh, Cody's a, he's a well-rounded fighter. Um, I'm willing to take... I'm willing to say that Trevin gets the job done here. And I like the, uh, the value at that plus 145 line. Uh, that would be a fun fight. Uh, give me Trevin to get that knockout. Two top 10 lightweight fighters throwing down here to kick the main card off. Mateus Gamra taking on Jalen Turner. Both of these fighters coming off a little bit of different type of performances. Gamra dropping the ball as he came in as a favorite against Benil Dariush. We know how talented Dariush is though. Uh, but at the end of the day, Gamra just didn't look that good in that fight. Uh, Jalen Turner... Uh, Jalen Turner, only 27 years old, he's been looking phenomenal going out there and just finishing everyone that he faces off against, uh, taking out Brad Riddell, Jamie Malarkey, who we, we just saw how talented Malarkey was in his last fight, showing his well-roundedness and all that, uh, went out there, finished him. Uh, Uros Medic, he has shown to be a dangerous fighter. He went out there, submitted him. Uh, Brock Weaver, not that high in him, but still went out there and just toyed with him, finished him. Uh, Joshua Koulibau, Koulibau has shown that he is talented, so that, that victory looks pretty good there. Uh, we take a look at his last loss against Matt Frivola, where he really struggled with his takedown defense. I think that he has shown some development in these last fights. Um, but the major question mark is, is that Mateus Gamrat is without a doubt a big step up in competition. Uh, Mateus Gamrat has shown that he's a very uh, high level grappler. We know that he's been being polished uh, in America, over at American Top Team for some, for some time now, uh, coming over from Poland. Uh, interesting fact, you see where he's shadow boxing and whatnot. Uh, Back in the, that's in a Coconut Creek, technically right on the edge of Coral Springs. I grew up right across the street over there. And back when I was a kid, uh, that that was all forced. I used to ride dirt bikes and, and, and adventure all throughout, right where he was just sitting there shadow boxing. But that whole area looks completely different these days. Um, you know, it's just funny to think I used to be a little kid, probably roaming right there, hit my dirt bike up um, where the modern day, Amer the new American top team is, uh, the new facility that they built some years ago. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to cut to the chase. I've been back and forth on this fight. I, I very well have, have been back and forth on this fight. I, I love Jalen Turner. I love what he's been doing as of recently. Uh, you know, he has shown that he's working on his takedown defense, but as I stated, uh, there is a difference in the, the level of competition of the guys that you've been seeing him go against compared to a guy, Mateus Gamrat. Uh, the other factor is uh, the tarantula is only 27 years old. So th there's some, some true growth that we're seeing from him. I mean, he's really maturing as a fighter, uh, and I think that his takedown defense has grown tremendously since his fight with Matt Frivola. Uh, I think that this fight is going to seriously come down to the fact, that can can the Tarantula stuff the takedowns of Gamrat? Or is, or is Gamrat going to have success with those takedowns? I think on the feet, I'm favoring Turner here. Turner has is going to have about a 7-inch reach advantage here. He's very tricky with his striking. Uh, I've been I've been back in the fourth since I've been back and forth with who I'm going to pick here. Literally since the point I've been uh, setting up to to record this segment here, I have gone back and forth, back and forth. I really want to take the dog here in Jalen Turner. Um, I'm just not extremely high on the grappling abilities of those those men that we just talked about that he's been defeating as of recently. Gamrat coming off that loss, I think he's going to be extremely motivated here. Oh man. 
But if Jalen Turner could stuff those takedowns, I think that he could really make Gamrat uh, pay for it. Um, I'm going to settle in with the Gamrat play. Uh, man, I was close to taking the dog there. I got to go with my gut. I think that Gamrat comes in very hungry here after taking that loss. And I think that I think he could solidify some takedowns. We've seen him go out there and really pull off some magic down on the mat, man. If you guys want to want to think about the fight, the fights that he's had as of recently, um, you know, knocking out Diego Fajera, uh, but uh, you know, the fight that he had against Jeremy Stevens, pulling off that that Kimura as fast as he did, that was ridiculous. Knocking out Scott Holtzman, eh, you know, um, but the fight against Armand Sarukian solidifying takedowns against a very tough fighter and Armand Sarukian late in that fight. We know that Armand Sarukian put up the toughest challenge against Islam Makashev uh, that we've seen up until that Alexander Volkanovsky fight. But we know how talented Islam is with his wrestling and all that. So I'm sorry, but I just think that Mateus Gamrat's grappling is going to be a major threat here. I need to see Turner showcase his takedown defense uh, against a, 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 a fighter of this caliber before I'm going to give him full credit that he's changed from the fighter that was taken down against a guy like Matt Frivola. Well, Travola has good wrestling, but there's kind of levels to the game here. I think Gamrat's a step above, and I'm going to take Mateus Gamrat here. Uh, but as we take a look at the betting line, we see Mateus Gamrat's a minus 170 favorite. That line looks pretty similar to uh, that Benil Dariush fight that he just had. Uh, the comeback on Jalen Turner at plus 145. I'm definitely saying that there's more value in the plus 145 line on Jalen Turner than the minus 170 line on Gamrat. I think that that line should should be closing to to be a closer line. Uh, like I said, I was, I'm back and forth on who, who I'm even picking here. I'm edging Gamrat to take this fight with his grappling and his wrestling. I think that line should come down to like the minus 145 uh, on Gamrat there, in my opinion. So more value on Turner at that plus 145 line. Matchup of two top 10 welterweight fighters, Jeff Hands of Steel Neal. Taking on Shavkat Rachmanov. Great to see Rachmanov getting a step up in competition here. I really want to see Shavkat uh, prove to be what people think he could be. We need to see it proven now. Uh, I want to see that hype start to really start to pick up. Uh, we know he's uber talented. Uh, he's coming off a, an extremely dominant performance where he went out there, uh, played around with Neil Magny, got the submission victory. Before that, takes out Carlston Harris uh, and Michel Prezeris before that. And then Cowboy Alex Oliveira. So, I want to say that I'm not really extremely impressed with the level of competition here. Besides Neil Magny, uh, there's really not a lot going on here. Uh, do understand that Neil Magny has a recent victory over Jeff Neal as well. Uh, I think that is definitely worth noting. Uh, Jeff Neal, he had two questionable performances before finally riding the ship and getting uh, the, the two victories that he just had. Uh, lost to uh, Stephen Thompson and Neil Magny, two higher higher level opponents. Uh, went to a split decision against Santiago Ponzinibbio, I, I believe, and then got the knockout over Vicente Luque. Uh, kind of getting things back on track. We know that that Jeff Neal is a dangerous striker. Uh, he has a victory over Mike Perry back in the day. And Jeff has just always shown that he's a dangerous fighter. Uh, but, but I think that he's going to have his plate full here. Shavkat Rachmanov is just uh, so well-rounded. He could strike. He can grapple. Uh, I would like him see. I would like to see him use the path of least resistance here and really look to mix things up. Uh, at times, Shavkat has shown to be a little bit stubborn. I, I wouldn't be shocked if he goes out here and tries to prove a point and and outstrike the very dangerous Jeff Neal, and that that could potentially be very dangerous for him. Uh, like I said, so I want to see him mix things up. I think if he uses his grappling early, he could really put himself in the driver's seat here and and, and go out here and go out there and get the job done. Only 28 years old. He's so promising. Uh, I mean, th this is really the the dark horse of the division. I think he is the dark horse of the division. Shavkat Rachmanov, he goes out here, he gets a victory over Jeff Neal, and then we're talking about some huge fights moving forward that I could just cannot wait to see. He'll have a two-inch reach advantage over Jeff Neal. He'll be two inches taller. We know that he has a great frame for the division. And I'm definitely le leaning uh, Shavkat Rachmanov, the undefeated fighter, 16-0. Out of those 16 victories, uh, half of them have came by way of KO, TKO. Uh, eight of them have come by way of submission. All 16 of his professional fights, he has finished. All right, he's an absolute stud. And, uh, and Jeff Neal's a stud as well. But I think Shavkat's just going to prove to be a step above. There's levels to this. And I just didn't like the way that Jeff Neal dropped the ball as of recently against, you know, Wonder Boy uh, and, and then the other loss that we talked about as well. Um, you know, th those were fight against um, 
excuse me here against uh, Neil Magny, the common opponent. You know, a little bit of MMA math there as well. So, uh, you know, those are some red flags in my opinion. Shavkat Rachmanov is a minus 525 favorite. He's a big time favorite. And that's just a number that we have seen next to his name where we're getting used to it. And that's a number that I think you, you're really going to continue to see until he starts to face off with the the top level uh, fighters in the division. I'm talking about top five, top three opponents. You know, you put him in there, uh, and depending on what's going on with Kamzat, if he's going to go up to middleweight, you put him in there with like a Kamzat. You put him in there with a, you know, a Colby, a Kamaru Usman, a Leon Edwards, and then that line's going to come down, which I'm intrigued to even see where that line settles. He might still be the favorite. I'm telling you guys, depending on what kind of performance he goes out there and puts right now, the hype is going to get very serious on Shavkat Rachmanov. The party is going to really kick off this upcoming Saturday. I'm taking Shavkat Rachmanov to finish the fight. That's what he does. He goes out there and finishes fights. That's what he's going to do. Give me Shavkat, Shavkat Rachmanov inside the distance here. Jamie, the Night Wolf picket, getting fed to the wolves here, taking on one of the brightest MMA prospects that we've ever seen, Bo Nickel. One of the most decorated wrestlers to ever come into the sport of MMA, uh, Bo Nickel, only 27 years old. He's so promising. I'm going to be ranting about him here in a second. Uh, th this is a, a a match that makes perfect sense. I love the fact that the UFC didn't throw Bo Nickel in uh, too, too deep in the water. He's a fighter that's only had three professional fights. Jamie Pickett is a seasoned veteran. He's not even really necessarily a UFC caliber opponent. If we're being honest, I think he loses this fight. He's cut and we don't see him in the octagon again. Um, but Jamie Pickett is a seasoned fighter. He's a, he's a well-rounded fighter. And I think it's only fair that Bo, Nick Bo Nickel gets this type of match in his UFC debut. Uh, I, I do want to see Bo Nickel uh, push through the ranks relatively quick after this match. I want to see him get tested because I really think he's going to hold his own. Uh, and we'll see how he performs here. He goes out here, gets a finish within the first 30 seconds, and then you know takes a step up there and we really start to cruise him through. Uh, but but I, I want to see him be tested uh, within the next year year to two years. I really want to see him fighting some of the best middleweight fighters in the world. You guys know that I feel that the middleweight division is very shallow. I would pick Bo Nickel right now over Alex Pajeda. I would take Bo Nickel right now over Israel Adesanya. And I understand that some of you guys are, are going to go berserk. I've already seen you guys on Instagram when I said this initially. Styles make fights. Of course, Izzy and Alex Pajeda would be extremely dangerous uh, as the fight kicks off on the feet. But I just believe that Bo Nickel would get a hold of those men and would take them down and would push a pace and, and would break them. I, I truly believe that. Um, yeah, it's yet to be seen. But, you know, when you're predicting fights and you're predicting what's going to go on in the sport of MMA, you know, you could sit there and you could be boring and you could just, uh, you, you could just go by the book and say, Nope, if, if it hasn't, if it hasn't happened yet, we're not going to give this fighter credit for being able to do that. I know this is very outlandish to say a guy that's only has three pro victories can take out, uh, the, the, the middle UFC middleweight champion, but styles make fights point blank point point blank period. Bo nickel would solidify takedowns with ease. I believe on Israel Adesanya and Alex Pajeda. There's definitely potential. He gets caught coming in, but I'm saying I would, I would take him there. Uh, you know, so Bo nickel is also a fighter that has shown to really have developed uh, his overall game extremely fast in the sport of MMA in just his three professional fights and understanding within those three professional fights, the fights were finished rapidly fast, but in that limited amount of time, uh, he has showcased some, some serious skills all around and his, in his MMA debut and his first pro fight, he goes out there and looked really good on the feet as long as that fight lasted and showcased some boxing skills, landing a knockout there. Uh, after that, uh, drops his opponent with the hands once again on Dana White's contender series the first time around showcasing that boxing and then wrapping up that guillotine in the second and then in his last fight in my opinion was that was the most impressive performance by Bo Nickel uh the way that he uh, solidified that that triangle choke um just, just show showcasing that he's very comfortable off his back as well in limited amount of time against lower level competition but you don't normally see fighters even coming over with the wrestling pedigree that Bo Nickel has uh, performing like that. Yeah, you'll see some of those wrestlers come in and you'll see them dominate opposition using the wrestling, you know, uh, just controlling them down in the mat, landing ground and pound. But you don't see the different layers uh, that, that we've seen in Bo Nickel and the, and the limited amount of pro fights that we've seen from him. Uh, I'm getting excited just talking about it because I really think that Bo Nickel uh, is going to show to be 
one of the greatest mixed martial arts of all time. I'm telling you guys right now, he's a future middleweight champion. I'm telling you guys right now, remember I'm saying this. So if you ever see him drop the ball or whatever, and it never happens, come back and you guys come, come after me. But I'm telling you, this kid's the truth. He's in the perfect division to wreak havoc. And he's going to be a problem. The confidence, you want to talk about a confident fighter. Bo Nickel is as confident as it gets. Check out some of the interviews that he's had. He's willing to step in there right now and take on a guy like Kamzat Shimaev. I mean, Kamzat, in my opinion, is stylistically a much more uh, stiff task for him compared to Izzy and, and, uh, and Pajera because Kamzat can actually wrestle and then we'll see how Bo Nickel shows to fight in, in a a a longer over a longer period of time in the cage and see how he o fights overall to striking and all that. Uh, but again, I'm just hyped up on this kid, Bo Nickel. He's going to go out here. He's going to steamroll Jamie Pickett. That's exactly what's going to happen. And you guys all know it. He's a minus 1400 right now, minus 1600 on Bavada. The line's ridiculous. It's probably going to creep up to the minus uh, 2000s. It is what it is. It's exactly what you guys all expected. You couldn't even be jump on this early. I mean, the, you were going to find this line at best right around a minus 1400. So, um, I mean, that, that's what you're looking at. And uh, what am I going to say about that line? The value's on Bo Nickel, but you shouldn't even be touching those types of lines because Bo Nickel is going to go out there and steamroll Pickett. See if you can possibly get a better line on inside the distance because he's going to finish Pickett. I'm telling you guys right now, he's going to knock Pickett out. Um, if you think but what, how, if you think back to the, uh, the fight that Pickett had uh, against... Uh, the karate guy, the Beverly Hills Ninja, who just got cut from the UFC, uh, who's about to get cut from the UFC. If you remember how he looked in that fight against Jordan Wright, imagine how he's going to look against Bo Nickel. I'm warning you guys. All right. Um, you know, we'll play devil's advocate real quick. Uh, the, the two victories he had as of recently over Lorraine, uh, Loreno Storopoli and Joseph Holmes, lower level opponents, coming off a knockout loss against Dennis Tealinen. He's getting smoked by, by Bo Nickel there. Brace yourself for that one. I absolutely love this matchup here. The number five female flyweight fighter in the world, Alexa Grosso, who's been on a tear, taking on the current champion, Valentina Shevchenko, also known to you guys as my favorite female mixed martial artist of all time. I have her as the GOAT of women's mixed martial arts. We could argue about that all day. Hit the comment section up below. I know she's coming off a, a performance that wasn't that impressive against Talia Santos. Uh, it was an off night, in my opinion. And I think that, uh, she, she's going to jump back here and look and look good. You want to talk about off nights. I mean, Amanda Nunez got got smoked by Juliana Pena and got finished in the first round. You want to talk about an off night. You guys know I had Valentina Shevchenko uh, defeating Amanda Nunez in those two bouts. They were very close. I thought she got robbed in that one split decision. Um, I want to see that fight ran back. I don't know if that's necessarily going to happen right now because the flyweight division is looking pretty good right now. You got fighters uh, like Aaron Blanchfield, uh, performing the way she's performing. You got Talia Santos looking good. You know, the rematch is warranted there as well. Um, so, you know, there's a lot going on in this division. And, uh, but stylistically, I think that this is a, a very good matchup for Valentina Shevchenko. Shevchenko has shown she needs to work on, on her takedown defense, right? Santos gave her some problems there. I think that Shevchenko kind of underestimated her there a little bit. We know that Shevchenko obviously is very well-rounded and very dangerous in the mat. You think about what she just did to Jessica Andraj uh, and who she's, what she's done to a lot of women throughout the years down on the mat. She's just a fine-tuned mixed martial artist. She does it all so well, but I love her striking. I and mean, you think about the way that she she throws down on the feet. It's just like watching a, a an artist. That that's how I th what I think of when I think of Valentina Shevchenko. I'm not sure if Joe Rogan said this before, but I truly believe it. It's ringing a bell in my head. Maybe he did, but I believe this. If you were no, I, I think he actually says Demetrius Johnson. So no, I'm the teller is saying this right now. If you were to model yourself after a mixed martial artist, if you're a young kid, I would. I would model my game after Valentina Shevchenko. I think she's so technical. I love her overall skill set. I love the way she strikes. She's so explosive. She's just on the on the balls of her feet, just ready to explode. And uh, I think that she's going to be the much more diverse striker here. And although Alexa Grasso has some solid boxing, I think that she's going to be in a little bit over her head here. Um, maybe I shouldn't say in over her head. She's been looking good as of recently, but Valentina is going to be a step above. Uh, Grosso has looked very good and she, she's been evolving rapidly. I mean, let's take a look at what she's been doing. Uh, she's only 29 years old. She hasn't even cracked the 30 mark yet. She's coming off a of win over Vivian Arajo, Joanne Calderwood, minus the Calder, uh, a victory over Macy Barber, 
That was a clo close match there. Uh, victory over Ji Young Kim. You know, she had the loss to Carla Esparza before that. She was taken down a couple times. So keep an eye on Valentina to potentially solidify some takedowns. I know that fight was a long time ago, but Alexa Grosso's uh, takedown defense, it, it does need to be tested a little bit more so. So keep an eye on that. And the major factor here is that Valentina will be able to keep this fight where she wants to keep it. And I think that that's, that's uh, a big factor for her. Uh, watch the explosive kicks that Valentina has. Of course, uh, the the head kick victory that she had over Jessica I, uh, one of the craziest finishes that we've ever seen in all WMMA. And um, you know that the bullets always just just cruising Earth, cru cruising the planet, touching all different types of countries, training all around the world. We know that she's a sharpshooter. She's a world class shooter. She's just she she does it all. She 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 really does it all. And um, you know, I'm getting a little hyped up here, man, going from Bo Nickel to Valentina Shevchenko. And then we're going to go to the main event here, too. I mean, I'm excited to talk about all the greatness that, that we've been witnessing with these fighters. And uh, I mean, Valentina, she's uh, she's the girl, man. Valentina's the girl. And uh, I'm sure some of you guys are not exactly on the same page with as I am there. And, uh, you know, let me know. Comment below. I wouldn't mind to engage you in the comment section of why she's a much better mixed martial artist than Amanda Nunez has shown to be. But uh, meet, meet me there. Uh, let's go take a look at the betting line where you will see that Valentina Shevchenko is a minus 650 favorite. We talk about fighters that have those high lines next to their name consistently. Valentina Shevchenko is always that. I mean, she settles in. She settles in a lot of times right around a minus 1,400 favorite. So this is nothing new. I think she did settle in as a minus 1,400 in her last fight against Talia Santos. I think that Santos stylistically was a little bit more of a problem for her. And I do believe Shevchenko underestimated her grappling there. Um... This fight is tailor-made for Shevchenko. Although Grosso is very dangerous with the boxing, Shevchenko is going to go out there and style on her with her overall kickboxing game. Give me Shevchenko to get the job done here. If you want to go after that minus 650 line, uh, go for it. Hey, you guys, real quick, got to let you know we're doing a special here. I'm offering you guys two fight cards for my official plays for free if you want to sign up through my referral link to bavada.lv. You guys know, in my opinion, it's the best sports book out there. You're going to get an added bonus to your account. Reach out to me. Get my official plays for the, for this fight card, UFC 285. I'm telling you, uh, we're, we're, we've been picking up some heat. We're on fire right now. We're starting to get that momentum going. You're going to want to jump on my, my official plays. Let's make some money here. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. Uh, shoot me an email if you want. Sc scrolling below or shoot me a DM on Instagram or Twitter. Here we go. We got the main event, John's. Here we go. We got the main event. John Bones Jones taking on Cyril Gaon. Jones bumping up to the heavyweight division. Uh, we've been hearing rumors about this for years. He's coming off a long layoff. Uh, I'm not really crazy about that. Coming off the long layoff, he's 35 years old and jumping up in weight. I, I think there's some major question marks to talk about here. Uh, but we know that John Jones has always risen to the occasion. Uh, you know, his most recent fight was against Dominic Reyes. I'll tell you what, I think that that was a fight that could have went either way. Dominic Reyes... Definitely slowed down in that fight, but started off very well, took the first two rounds, and then it came down to the third round, I believe, of, of uh, whether if you were going to go to Jones or Reyes there. Uh, the Santos fight, Jones slowed down in that fight, really, and Santos had a lot of uh, success there. Some people thought that Santos took that fight. I mean, we're talking about very iffy performances from from Jones, really, in, the, in, in these, these last couple of matches, dating back to the Alexander Gustafson fight where he actually went out, out there and dominated Gustafson, got the takedown, smashed him up. Um, I mean, of course, the victory over Cormier uh, two times, uh, the victory over OSP as well. That was a fight that he came back after they started to enhance the drug testing, and he didn't look that good in that fight, right? If you guys remember that, OSP had a lot of success in that fight. I mean, if you you really want to talk about John Bones Jones and all this greatness, I know that if he didn't make that one mental error against Matt Hamill, his resume is just amazing. He's undefeated. There's not a blemish on his resume besides that. Uh, but when you actually look into some of those fights that we're talking about there, we're talking about fights that he potentially lost. And I don't know how you guys talk about a GOAT that has so many fights that, that were so close or where he's just barely squeaked by. Everybody wants to talk about the victories that he had early in his career where he took the belt, where he took out all these veterans. I'm sorry, but I felt that the light heavyweight division was pretty shallow in my opinion. You had a lot of these guys coming over from Pride that, I don't know, man, Shogun Hua... Uh, I mean, we can go over some of those names. I mean, maybe I'm being a little harsh, but you know, Rampage Jackson. I mean, Rashad Evans, in my opinion, was one of his 
uh, one of his biggest wins. Rashad Evans was a very talented fighter at that time, and he went out there and took him out. But I just feel a lot of these fighters were overrated, in my opinion. Uh, you know, the the Brandon Veras, the Vladimir uh, Matashenkos, the Shogun, who was, I don't know, I'm sorry, man, sorry, Shogun, but, you know, Machida. These these guys, they had all the, they had the names, but... You know, I like the Glover Teixeira victory. He's, he's The Cormier victories were legit, obviously, very legit. But you got to kind of decipher through his resume a little bit, in my opinion. Um, where Cyril Gaon, on the other hand, one of the more most talented heavyweight strikers that we've ever seen. You know, people want to talk about that loss that he just took against Francis Ngannou. Uh, not really going in detail on the fact that it came down to the fifth round and Cyril was taking over that fight. And he made that stupid mistake where he was in Francis's guard early, dropped back for some type of leg lock, and then gave Francis the position. Everybody wants to glance over that. If Cyril Gaon just plays that fight patiently, sits in his guard, racks up some points, uh, just you know works some ground and pound, Cyril Gaon is, is the current heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, he's still undefeated. And that's facts. I don't care. Run the tape back. You can say what you want, but, but that is facts. He dropped back for a leg lock that he had no business dropping back for. And he, he had some moments in that fight or he had a major moment in that fight where he showed to be green still in those grappling exchanges and in that big moment where he was fighting for the belt. I think he has learned from that that mistake there. Um, but at the end of the day, I was not a fan of of the grappling that we saw from Francis Ngannou and Cyril Ghosn in that fight going late into to the, going late in that fight. And, you know, everybody wanted to rave about Francis Ngannou's grappling. I'm sorry. I think that you guys are off on that. I think that that was a matchup of two lower level grapplers uh, going back and forth, two dangerous strikers, talented strikers, but at that, on that same token, very green grapplers. And I think that you put guys like Stipe Miocic, John Jones, which I'm going to get to my pick here. You put those types of fighters in, in with them in a, those, in a dog fight. They're going to get the better. We saw that with Stipe and Francis Ngannou when the fight actually took place uh, for a longer period of time. Yeah, he got clipped in, in the rematch, but yeah, Francis Ngannou will do that to you. Uh, but I'm talking about in a dog fight, I'm saying John Jones is going to out-wrestle Cyril Gaon here. He's going to get takedowns and he's going to work some nasty ground and pound. Um, I'm rolling with Johnny Bones Jones here. I, I think that stylistically he's going to be a problem for Cyril Gaon. Now, if he struggles with those takedowns, I think that that Cyril Gaon is going to style on John Jones on the feet. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna cut this clean right now. I'm going to say this is a stylistic clash of a striker versus a grappler. I know that John Jones can strike, and he's a very uh, unorthodox striker. He has a lot of skills there, but Cyril Gaon will outstrike him. We just seen John Jones struggle recently with, with strikers that are definitely a, a drop from a Cyril Gaon, even smaller guys too. Cyril Gaon, I think, will play with him from the outside. I'm telling you guys right now. So John has to be careful coming on, coming in on the inside. He can get clipped with the shot. We know Cyril's super dangerous. And we know that Cyril is, will be working on his overall game. Remember the heel hook that he pulled off on uh, on Dontel Mays. I, I think that you should stay, stay away from those types of attempts. John will make you pay down on the mat um, if you make any type of mistake, but, uh, I don't even think that gone will be in a position like that to drop back for a heel hook because Jones will be the guy that's on top. Uh, Jones just needs to be careful early on in this fight, uh, early on or in general, if he's not able to get that takedown and they play around on the feet, Cyril's extremely dangerous. Um, John Jones is going to have a three and a half inch reach advantage here. Uh, both men are the same height. And uh, I'm going with, with one of the true goats of the game. I'm going with John Jones to get the job done here. So John Jones is a minus 165 favorite over gone. I think that that is more than deserving. Wouldn't be surprised if you see that line creep up to the minus 200 range. People are going to start buzzing about John Jones. You're going to see a lot of media put out there about him, how he is one of the goats of the game. You're going to see it all over ESPN. You're going to see that action start to come in on him. If you want to get Jones, I think you should jump on that line early. That, that's how I think the line's going to move. We'll see. Uh, but Jones does have to be careful on the feet, and he does have to solidify those takedowns. And there is there, there are some, some questions to talk about. We talked about the long layoff, the jumping up in weight, and those questionable performances against uh, the, the opposition as of recently. But the wrestling will come in, in handy. I think he'll solidify those takedowns in the dogfight. Jones has also sh showed to have very high fighter IQ. I think that he pulls this one out. Uh, give me one of the goats of the game, John Jones here in his return fight to get the job done. And I'd, I'd side him on that minus 165 line. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up the UFC 285 prediction video. Hopefully this helped you guys out uh, from a betting perspective, or if you just wanted to get 
a little bit more in touch with these matchups for the big card. I appreciate you guys stopping by. Please hit that like button if you guys haven't already. We've got thousands of you guys tuning in. Uh, let, let's run that, that like button up. It really helps me out, guys. Uh, as I stated, got the free bet here on the channel too. Uh, so I'm trying to throw a bone your guys way, but understand if you guys want some real action on this fight card, besides the free play, uh, hit me up and we could work something out. I'll give you all my official places. I'm going to have a lot of action on this card. All right, guys, I'm telling you, we're, we're heating up right now. As I said, uh, sh shoot me a message if you guys are interested there. Uh, and as we sign out, uh, I want to give a special thank you to you guys that are still here listening to me talk because, uh, you know, this video wasn't that short, but this is a card that was deserving uh, to, to put some time into it. And you guys are my real supporters out there. I appreciate you guys more than anything. I hope you guys are all doing great out there. I truly hope you're doing great out there. And, and uh, you know, you, you, you got your, your eye on the ball. You guys are taking care of yourself, eating good, working out. And uh, more importantly, uh, you know, we, we're also, we're most likely all sports bettors here for the most part. So I hope you guys are being smart about your, your betting. You guys aren't doing anything reckless and, and you're, you're budgeting your bets and you're, you're being smart about what you do. I don't want to see anybody out there having any type of gambling issues, uh, you know, seriously guys, cause you know, you know how it gets at times, man, chasing your losses and whatnot. Just take a deep breath. If you had a couple losses as of recently, uh, and just slow things down. You, if you're get, if you have that urge, like you need to chase that money, and you need to double up real quick. You need to catch catch up. I'm telling you, if you give it, if you man up, take a walk, take a day, take 24 hours. I promise you, after those 24 hours, that you will not crave that action as much as you did right after the loss. So think about that. Just hold off for a little bit, and then it gets easier from there. And before you know it, a week or two passes and you ain't even thinking about that. And then you could ease your way back in making intelligent bets. All right, guys, if you're going to bet on sports, make sure you're making intelligent moves out here. All right, guys. So I'll leave you guys with that and um, appreciate you guys. I hope you guys are seeing the evolution of this channel because uh, we're about to take over the game. Signing out. Tell her. Uh -huh. Welcome to the show. This the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.